Hi class, uh, welcome to our lecture this week, coming to you from uh, Big Fork, Montana, with my grandparents for my birthday. I drove up here as like a road trip just for me. Uh, so as a reminder, we won't have an in-person component uh, or a live Zoom recording. I'm doing it right now. Uh, I'll post this on YouTube. You're watching this on YouTube, presumably, um, shortly after I record it. Uh, so don't show up to class tomorrow. Uh, nobody will be there. Um, so this week we're talking about personal identity. Uh, last week we did Descartes' meditations and stopped uh, about a third of the way through the complete meditations on the big question Descartes asks is, what is the I that I've proven with the cogito, right? So in the cogito, Descartes says, I think, therefore I am, that uh, even if I'm being deceived, at the very least, uh, I am a thinking thing. And as uh, a thing that thinks, uh, I know at least that I exist, right? But beyond the self being a thinking thing, what more could it be? And this is a big question that, that Descartes leaves open and, and asks us, asks himself. Uh, and he does some work at answering it. But really, the question of personal identity, what self and I is, though it's touched upon in Descartes and in other earlier philosophers as well. It's not given, um, strictly speaking, a uh, real philosophical treatment until uh, John Locke comes around. And that's what we read for today, is uh, the first true, concise, analytical, conceptual analysis of personal identity as a concept, as a question, and as a problem. Uh, and going forward from John Locke, uh, every view of personal identity can pretty much be traced back to him um, as either uh, a foil or uh, a development of his uh, psychological continuity criterion or, or memory criterion, which we'll be looking at today. So that's what we have to look forward to. Let's get into it. So some background on Locke uh, and what the importance of personal identity is, and then we'll talk about the views that Locke rejects. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about Locke's own psychological continuity criterion while also anticipating a few problems. So uh, as we go through the lecture, we'll see some reasons that we might want to object to uh, Locke's view and historically why thinkers have objected to the view. Um, Locke does anticipate some of these objections and answers them in his own way, though we may feel that those answers are more or less satisfactory to uh, the weight of the problems that uh, are presented by his positive account of what personal identity consists in. So some background on Locke and, and identity. Uh, John Locke was a British empiricist. So this is to be contrasted with uh, Descartes, who's typically put into the rationalist school of thought. So there was this big distinction, which still really does exist today, though um, less um, in, in less of a crystalline form, but uh, back in the Enlightenment period, there were the rationalists and the empiricists, and they operated in two very alternative schools of thought, where the rationalists thought that there was such a thing as a priori knowledge or knowledge in our heads, uh, the sort of uh, knowledge that you could have without ever experiencing the world. Uh, and the empiricists uh, famously thought alternatively that there's no such thing as a priori knowledge, there's no knowledge that you couldn't have uh, before or that you could have before experience, all of the stuff that goes on in our minds uh, is derivative of our experience in the world. Um, John Locke operates in the empiricist school, uh, you know, the, saying that we're all blank slates and that um, the the tabula rasa upon which we're uh, we're developed is uh, how we grow into the people that we are. Uh, as opposed to Descartes, who thought that there was all sorts of innate knowledge, uh, like the fact that we're a thinking thing, uh, or mathematical a priori proofs, etc. So John Locke comes from the school of British empiricists. Um, famously publishes an essay concerning human understanding in 1690. This is uh, the book from which the section that I selected for us that came or comes from. Um, this is what we read, just a piece of it. 
Uh, and he also published two treatises on government as well as sent like a bajillion letters to all sorts of academics all around. He was very famous in his day for being one of the, the brightest, most brilliant minds uh, in Europe. Um, so Locke on, hold on, I'm gonna pause the recording just real quick. Okay, sorry, a little technical difficulty. I just had to like move Zoom windows out of the way. Okay, so Locke's innovations on personal identity. What does Locke give to this debate? Well, really, he kind of invents the debate on personal identity. He's the one that uh, takes a real, as I mentioned, a real philosophical interest for the very first time in the question of personal identity. So uh, Locke gives us a clear formulation of the problem which is the problem of numerical identity of persons across time. So this is to contrast um, some terms of art here, numeric identity with qualitative identity. So where we get numeric identity is, is something that Locke is gonna define for us and, and explain, um, but it's to be contrasted with qualitative identity, which um, is less, uh, it, it's more of an implied definition from what Locke gives us than, uh, explicit, so we'll, we'll cover it right now. Um, numeric identity is probably best expressed, and if I had a whiteboard in front of me, I'd write it for you, but um, in terms of Leibniz's law, so Leibniz is another uh, uh, Enlightenment philosopher, uh, part of the rationalist school, um, who is a librarian of Hanover, and he, he's one of my absolute favorite philosophers. His writing is just Fantastic. Anyways, uh, Leibniz's law says that uh, basically x equals y if x has all of the same uh, properties of y. So it, what this is supposed to be is uh, 2 equals 2. This is a numeric identity. Or uh, this square at this time is the same as that square at that time. Um, that some particular object is identical numerically with itself only if and only if it shares all of the same properties, uh, temporally, spatially, physically, et cetera, with itself, right? If any of those properties changes, it no longer has a numeric identity with itself, which is something that Locke goes through. Now, this is to be contrasted with qualitative identity. So for instance, um, you might have, I, uh, let's see if I have some objects uh, that would work for this. Um, Not quite. So let's imagine, just use your creative imaginative powers because I know you're creative imaginative people. Imagine that these are the same publication, right? That we have two copies of uh, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous rather than one of On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous and Three Rings, A Tale of Narrative, uh, Exile, and Fate. Um, imagine that these are like the same book. So numeric identity, this book is numerically identical to itself, right? Because it shares all and only the same properties with itself. But if we had two copies of On Earth Were Briefly Gorgeous, imagining that this is like the same copy as this book, um, they would look just the same, but they're not the same, right? I have like two, I have one book in each hand. Uh, so qualitative identity, the, the two books that are the same publication will be qualitatively identical in the case that it's the same book, but different objects. So they're not numerically identical, even though they look like the same book, you open up any page and it's gonna be the same text on it. They're, they're only qualitatively identical. They only share a qualitative identity with one another. They don't have the numeric identity because they exist in different spaces. One of them exists in my right hand, one of them exists in my left hand, right? That uh, one of them is kind of moving like this and the other is moving like this. You know, so they don't share all of the same properties, which would uh, obstruct their um, uh, numeric identity, though they would be qualitatively identical. So what really matters for persons across time is a numeric identity. We're not looking for uh, copies and clones, uh, which we might be curious about from the Bernard Williams reading, which we'll talk more about, turns out, next week. Um, but really what we're interested in is a numeric identity, what really consists of that person, that self, that identity through a period of time numerically. So Locke also moves from an emphasis on substance, body, life, and soul to an emphasis on mind when it comes to questions of identity. Okay, so uh, we're, we're going to care less 
given Locke's argument about substance or body, like physical constitution or like this particular form, uh, my life or even my soul. Now, Locke is, is a religious man uh, and lives at a very religious time where it's uh, uncomfortable to do philosophy and, and uh, general intellectual work that is contra the church. Uncomfortable is sort of a light way of putting it. Um, but in any case, Locke is going to move the emphasis of, of identity away from the soul to something else, which ends up being consciousness and memory, which is kind of an interesting move, uh, though he tries to do it politically in a way that won't get him in trouble. So uh, we'll, we'll see some of that in a moment. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, most contemporary theories of personal identity can be traced to Locke as variants of a psychological continuity theory or as explicit opponents to it. People still to this day will take Locke as a foil and say, here's what Locke says and here's why he's wrong. Um, you know, he's, he's writing, what is it, like 350 years ago almost and uh, is still treated as a, a worthy opponent in the, the philosophy of personal identity. Um, the, the field of philosophy that he really invents. Okay, so uh, of identity and diversity, what we're gonna see in, in this section of the lecture is a distinction between two potential criteria for numeric identity of persons across time. One is a substance criteria, meaning like physical matter stuff, like atoms and whatnot. Um, uh, the constitution of objects in an actual extended physical space. Uh, and the other, uh, which we'll look at in a moment, is a continuity criterion, which says uh, something more along the lines of, it's not about the physical constitution of the extended object in space, the matter itself, but rather some other continuous property, a property of cont contiguity that exists in the matter that makes it what it is. So we'll see both of these contrasted against one another, and then how Locke uh, uh, contends with them or, or treats them. So the first form of identity that Locke considers in this section of uh, an essay concerning human understanding is of simple bodies or of atoms. So think of like an individual atom, one single itty bitty little atom. Uh, of this, Locke says that the identity of an atom uh, is a continued body under one immutable superface uh, existing in a determined time and place. It is evident that considered in any in instance of its existence, it is in that instance the same with itself. For being at that instant what it is and nothing else, it is the same and so must continue as long as its existence is continued. Okay, so what he's saying here uh, is that simple bodies are to be con contrasted with complex bodies insofar as a simple body, a single unit of atom is identical with itself as long as it undergoes no changes. Um, and exists at some single instant. Now, let's say we don't have just one single atom, but a clump of them put together. We have not one, but say 10 atoms. What is the identity of this mass of bodies, this mass of atoms? Well, if two or more atoms be joined together, the mass consisting of the same atoms must be the same mass. Every one of those atoms will be the same by the foregoing rule. And whilst they exist united together, the mass consisting of the same atoms must be the same mass. Let the part be ever so differently jumbled. But if one of these atoms be taken away or one new one added, it is no longer the same mass or same body. So here's why we get a substance criterion from these quotes is what Locke is saying is like, look, in the case of one atom or some collection of atoms, as long as there's no physical changes, the substance uh, the, the physical constitution of either the mass or the, the individual element is enough to say that, okay, that's the same thing, right? If you shift around the atoms that are in the mass, uh, it'll appear to be a different mass. It'll have different properties, uh, namely the, the locative or, or the, the like location of uh, the different atoms in that mass. And so, so it'll be different from what was before and, and not satisfy numeric identity. Um, but this, the, the substance criterion just says it's the, the physical constitution of the body, either individual or held together, that makes it what it is numerically. And so a substance criterion is going to do us right for simple physical objects like atoms and like masses of atoms. However, 
if we start to look to more complex objects, right, not just masses of atoms, but of actual artifacts themselves, like the chair I'm sitting in, or say like a book or some conceptually thick, uh, 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 complex mass of atoms that has its own concept built in, a substance criterion might not do it for us anymore. We need something like a continuity criterion that it's not just the physical constitution of the book that makes the book what it is, because there could be two different copies of it, right? Um, the, the, the substance of the book isn't enough. We need some sort of property that uh, persists in the, the subject. So what Locke says of uh, non-living artifacts like books and chairs and table. If we would suppose this machine, one, it, one continued body, all whose organized parts were repaired, increased or diminished by a constant addition or separation of insensible parts with one common life, we should have something very much like the body of an animal with this difference, that in an animal, the fitness of the organization and the motion wherein life consists coming from within, but uh, in machines, the force coming sensibly from without. So here we have a contrast of artifact with living organism. So what, what Locke is saying is that, look, uh, the continuity of a complex artifact is to be distinguished from the life of an animal, even though they both look a little bit the same. So. If we were in person, I might ask you this question. Say uh, I have a boat and it's an old wooden boat. It's made of a bunch of logs and boards. And as I sail the boat around the world, uh, I remove a piece of it at every point, right? And then replace it with an exactly identical piece. So uh, as one board breaks against the, the breakers of the ocean, uh, I have my carpenter uh, uh, craft an identical board and place it in that spot. Now say uh, I sail this ship for several decades and over the course of the several decades, piece by piece, it's replaced. So after 20 or 30 years of sailing, none of the original pieces of wood that made up the boat are present on the boat. It's all been recrafted, but the boat looks exactly the same. The question is, do I have the same boat? Uh, and for Locke, if it's a boat, that seems to be enough, as long as uh, the organization of parts for an artifact remains the same, that is enough to call it the same boat. However, um, for objects for whom the force of motion, the, this, uh, what does he call it, the life within is the, the force that comes sensibly from within, that, that moves the body, is... Uh, is within the body itself rather than outside of the body. So it's like the wind that moves the boat rather than some sense of desire or will, right? A, like conscious object, uh, a mental state. Um, we need a, a different form of, of uh, identity though similarly continuous. So in the case of living organisms, the case is not so much different in brutes in an animal, the fitness of organization and the motion wherein life consists begin together the motion coming from within. Uh, so for animals, what makes an animal the same animal that it is through time is uh, uh, the, the continuity of the uh, organization that consists in its like motive powers, its ability to move itself through the world. The acorn and the tree that it becomes are the same insofar as there's the same life, the same animal life in it. But for humans, this also shows where in the identity of the, the same man consists, which is to say, in nothing but a participation of the same continued life by constantly fleeting particles of matter in succession vitally united to the same organized body. So here we have a continuity criterion of a human living organism as well, that, not to say the, the person that's in us, but the human body. So the human body persists similarly to the uh, praying mantis body insofar as it has a motive of power coming from within that moves it through the world. And what matters to the body is the organization of, of parts, right? The fact that like my lungs accept air, they translate the oxygen into blood that my heart then pumps throughout my body, making the organs work and, and everything go, right? That my physical constitution has uh, certain conditions that are met organizationally and my force of life is what's continuous throughout that body to make it the same. Okay, so let's summarize. 
The substance criteria work only for the identity of the simplest objects, right? Atoms and simple masses, right? That are unconceptual, unconceptually thick, the sort of thing that we talked about. For the identity of most of our natural and artifactual kinds, Locke proposes a continuity criteria, uh, which is to say it's not just the physical substance that matters, but some other persistent property within, be it the force of movement, the organization of, et cetera, right? But none of these criteria are adequate for identity of persons over time. What, what we've made adequate is the, the identity of like a body, a, a, a living body, um, but this is not consistent or enough sufficient for uh, the identity of a person. The body is not just a person. So here's Locke's aims. Here's Locke is gonna give his personal uh, positive account of what uh, personal identity is. And his positive account is gonna need to jump through some hoops. He's gonna need to hit a bullseye in his target. So he wants to give an account of numerical identity of persons across time, right? He doesn't want to say that clones of people because they look like the same or they act the same, like say twins or whatever. Um, have you seen the prestige? Um, that that, uh, that that twins would be the same person even though they look the same and they act the same. Um, they're, they may be qualitatively identical, but we want numeric identity. We want a, a way to individuate between uh, clones or twins are, are very closely qualitatively identical individuals. So we want an account of numeric identity of persons across time that one is consistent with the possibility of an afterlife. Like I said, Locke is a religious man and so wants a, uh, an account of uh, personhood that is consistent with, me, with his religious convictions, but also B, provides some explanation of the fact that personal identity matters to each of us from a first-person perspective. So personal identity isn't some uh, haughty, toddy, babbly, metaphysical question. We, we care about who and what we are. Um, we're invested in our personal identity. But there's a, a tension between A and B for Locke, since the standard candidate for A, which is a soul, that the the, the what makes us persist uh, in an afterlife is our soul, is not the sort of thing that's consistent with what we care about, right? The, the, you might, but that's not to say that we shouldn't or don't care about our souls. It's just that the soul is an ephemeral, indefinable, who knows what or where it is sort of thing. Um, the soul is, is a, a postulate, uh, a floaty, who knows what, uh, but it's not the, the same sort of caring or uh, conscious consistency that we have in um, psychological unity. Um, the soul is some other object that's supposed to be in us. So this is a tension. Locke is going to say, look, the soul is not what personal identity consists in, uh, but what personal identity consists in could continue on through a soul. And this, this is kind of the, the path through um, the, the weeds here. So let's look at some of the views that Locke rejects first before uh, we look at his positive account. So Locke will reject a body criterion for numeric personal identity through time. Uh, he'll reject the human life or animal criterion that like this body, that this physical vessel is what uh, my person is through time, which is if you read the Bernard Williams for this week as well, the Bernard Williams piece makes some really compelling arguments to press your intuitions in the opposite direction saying like, no, actually our bodies do kind of like really matter quite a lot for our personal identity. And Locke is also gonna reject a soul credit. He's gonna say like, look, the, the soul is not what personal identity consists in. So he's gonna reject a substance criterion and a couple forms of continuity criteria, but he will end with a positive account that is consistent with, it's a type of continuity criteria. It's just not gonna be the continuity of human or animal life or the continuity of one's soul. Okay, so rejecting the body criterion. Um, persons are bodies. So here's the, the body criterion of personal identity. A person P2, that's their name, at T2, meaning time two at some later time. So a person P2 at some later time is the same person as P1 at T1, uh, at an earlier time, if and only if P2 at T2 is the same physical body at, of P1 at T1. So if person one at time zero or time one has a body and person two at some later time has a body and those two bodies are identical, 
then P1 equals T1. That's what this definition says. So as Locke puts it, the limbs of his body are to everyone a part of himself. He sympathizes and is concerned for them. Cut off a hand and thereby separate it from that consciousness he had of its heat, cold, and other affections, and it is then no longer a part of that which is himself any more than the remotest part of matter. So I, I'm not going to play the video over the recording, uh, but it, the, it's the scene. You can click it yourself in the, the uh, lecture if, if you open it up. Just pause and watch the video here. It's the, the Black Knight scene from Monty Python's Holy Grail, right, where the knights are fighting and the Black Knight has all of his limbs cut off, but he's still kind of the same guy, right? Um, that as he loses his arms and his legs, he still reasons and, and wants to fight and stop and uh, bite the legs off of King Arthur as he's walking by, right? It, it, just because he loses a few limbs here and there, it's just a flesh wound. It's not like he's really substantially changed. So similar Locke says, look, we could lose our hand or our arm or whatever, and we lose an important part of ourselves, but we don't lose ourselves, right? So the body criterion is not gonna be enough to constitute a uh, real robust personal identity. Personality persists even after we lose body parts or our bodies change. So we'll move on to some forms of continuity criteria. So let's, he rejects the human life or, or human animal criterion, which is in similar definition, P2 at T2 is the same person as P1 at T1, if and only if uh, P2 at T2 is the same human animal as P1 and T1. Whosoever should see a creature of his own shape or make though it had no more reason all its life than a cat or a parrot would still call him a man. So this is to say that, look, if there's a human that barks like a dog all their life and never actually communicates and is sort of feral or, or however you might describe this person, um, they probably need all sorts of help, but you wouldn't call that person uh, an animal. You'd call them a human still, right? Uh, a human with some sort of awful affliction, but still a human. So Locke is denying the sufficiency of being human for being a person, um, but he's also going to de deny the necessity. So sufficiency and necessity, I'll define for you in just a moment. They're sort of terms of art in logic and, and falsely, they're important to know. Um, so, so this is a, a rejection of sufficiency. He also rejects the necessity of being a human for being a person. So, or whoever should hear a cat or a parrot discourse, reason, and philosophize would call it nothing but a cat or a parrot and say, the one was a dull, irrational man and the other a very intelligent, irrational parrot. So what Locke is saying here is, look, if a parrot starts talking to us, like if I turned into a parrot right now and started and continued to give you this lecture, you would say, hmm, I feel pretty compelled to call you a person. And you might even afford that parrot uh, some uh, uh, moral rights or, or uh, uh, a moral worth uh, because it does reason and think so well. And so here Locke is denying the necessity of being a human for being a person. And so Locke does ultimately argue that the human animal criterion thus fails, that being having this sort of physical body as it is, is insufficient uh, or and unnecessary to, to personhood. So let me define sufficiency and necessity for you really quick. Um, sufficiency and necessity exist on either end of a conditional. So if I say, if it's raining, then the ground will be wet. I have a necessary now, I have a sufficient condition. Uh, if it's raining, so that the fact of rain is sufficient for the ground being wet, okay? That just, which is just to say that anytime there's rain, the ground will be wet. So the, the rain is sufficient to explain the ground being wet. Now, alternatively, uh, we might say that the ground being wet is a necessary condition of it raining. That uh, if, if someone says it's raining, but the ground isn't wet, then you'd say, well, you're confused about what it means for it to be raining because you can't have rain without the ground being wet. Um, we could think of uh, an alternative example. Uh, uh, It is a sufficient condition uh, for uh, a teacher um, that they stand in front of the classroom and teach. So if someone is standing in front of a classroom and teaching, that activity is sufficient 
for them being a teacher insofar as there's a person in front of a classroom teaching that we can guarantee that that person is a teacher. Now, you might say that a necessary feature of teaching is that students are educated, right? So if someone stands in front of a, a classroom uh, and lectures, but no students are educated, then they wouldn't be a teacher, right? Because there's a missing necessary condition. There's like an essential component that isn't present. And so we can strike away the fact that they're teaching. They might just be, um, you know, like recording for a silent film or something, teaching nobody at all because there's no actual voice or, you know, something like that. So necessary and sufficient conditions, right? Um, and if, if um, a criteria is neither necessary nor sufficient for personal identity, then it's no good criteria at all. And this is what the human life criterion is supposed to be for Locke. So when Locke says, look, if you have a body that has no reason whatsoever, we would still call it a person, that a, a body is enough to call it a person. So um, the, the sufficiency of being human for being a person is, is broken here. But similarly, if you don't have a body, but you still reason and, and uh, uh, speak well, uh, if, if you uh, communicate and act as if you were a human, though you're in a parrot's body, then we would still call that person a person, that parrot a person or that cat a person. And so having a human body is not necessary for considering someone to be a person either. Okay, so being having this sort of human body is neither necessary nor sufficient for being a person. That um, you got to have something else. In the case of being the the human body that barks all day long, you, you got to have a mind that operates in the right sort of way. And that if you have the mind that operates in the right sort of way, it could be in a parrot or in a cat or whatever. It doesn't matter. So finally, Locke is going to reject the sole criterion, which we should recognize the formula of this definition by now. P2 at T2 is the same person as P1 at T1, if and only if P2 at T2 has the same soul as P1 at T1, right? So that P2 and P1 at the person one and person two are the same person. They're, they're really like, like Bob is Bob over here. Uh, Bob at, at 12 is the same as Bob at 1 p.m., uh, just so long as Bob has the same soul in both cases. So here's what Locke says about the soul uh, continuing as a criterion for personal identity. Let anyone reflect upon himself and conclude that he has in himself an immaterial spirit. Let him also suppose it to be the same soul that was in Nestor or Thersites at the siege of Troy. For souls being as far as we know anything about them in their nature indifferent to any parcel of matter, the supposition has no apparent absurdity in it. A soul could be anything. We don't really know what a soul is, says Locke. Which it may have been as well as it is now the soul of any other man. The soul of Nestor, Thersites, now being your soul, could have been anybody's soul in the middle, like in between the, the time of the Bronze Age and now when it inhabits you. But he, now having no consciousness of any of the actions either of Nestor or Thersites, does or can he conceive himself the same person as either of them? Can he be concerned in either of their actions, attribute them to himself, or think them his own more than the actions of any other man ever, uh, ever existed? And Locke is going to say, no, probably not. That uh, you might suppose that you have the soul of Nestor, but do you have the experiences of Nestor just because you suppose that you have Nestor's soul? Well, not if you're, uh, uh, I mean, maybe if you have some sort of um, uh, mental uh, uh, divergence, but certainly not if you are uh, a regular person, you're, you're not going to say, well, I suppose that I have the soul of Nestor and I certainly remember sieging Troy. It, it's kind of an absurd statement, right? Um, so we might say that, look, souls can be recycled and reused and they might just pass through us at every moment because we don't really know what souls are. Um, empirically speaking. We can't measure uh, a soul. We can't run an experiment that uh, isolates and controls for the existence of one soul over another. And so uh, we can't say what a soul is. And so it might be that, that you do have someone like Nestor with their side of soul, um, but you don't have their experiences. But this would make no more sense. This would no more make him the same person as Nestor than if some of the particles of matter that were once a part of Nestor were now a part of this man. So, say, like this molecule that I'm holding in my finger 
uh, and I'm pinching, right? These molecules uh, once existed inside Nestor's body. Now they exist inside mine. Am I Nestor? Well, no, that's ridiculous. Similar with a soul. Uh, the same immaterial substance without the same consciousness. No more making the same person by being united to any body than the same particle of matter without consciousness united to any body makes the same person. So the same soul is not sufficient for identity of persons since distinct persons can have the same soul. It's, it's at least theoretically possible, according to Locke, that we could recycle souls in the same way that we can recycle matter, but we don't claim to be the people for whom a soul has been recycled, nor do we claim to be the, the person for whom uh, matter is recycled. And this is because we don't share the same consciousness, right? So if we look back at this quote, uh, we see an emphasis from Locke in his questioning at the end here that uh, the, 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 what matters is, is Nestor's actions or your actions uh, and the experiences of those actions, which the soul does not guarantee for us. And if the soul can't guarantee a unity of consciousness with respect to uh, our actions and experiences, then it's probably not a good candidate for uh, the numeric identity of persons across time. So Locke is also gonna argue that the same soul is uh, unnecessary for the identity of persons. Uh, distinct souls can occupy the same person. Okay, so here we have a rejection of uh, body criterion, and we have a rejection of two forms of continuity criterion. So what is going to be a positive account for Locke? What can account for the numeric identity of persons through time? Uh, and for Locke, as we should know from the reading, this is a psychological continuity criterion, which will eventually turn into memory. So throughout Locke's critiques of alternative criteria for identity of persons, he invokes considerations of consciousness. I've seen this in all of the quotes. The core intuition for Locke is that we continue as persons and are continuous with a past person, meaning like if I'm P2 right now, I'm continuous with P1, the person that I used to be, by virtue of continued conscious experience, that there's a unity, a continuity. So it's, we're looking at a continuity criterion, not a substance one. We're looking at a continuity criterion of consciousness and conscious experience. Thus, broadly, psychological continuity is the criterion for personal identity according to Locke. So as Locke says, person. We must consider what person stands for, which is a thinking intelligent being that has reason and reflection and can consider itself as itself, the same thinking thing in different times and places, which it does only by that consciousness, which is inseparable from thinking oh, and essential to it. So persons are conscious, thinking, intelligent things that can recognize this fact of themselves, and they continue to recognize themselves as that same conscious, thinking, intelligent thing through time. So here, we have Locke giving us a definition of persons across time. Boom. So here's a person across time, right? Running, jogging, and it's the same person here because look, we can see their actions, um, continuously uh, 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 represented. Similar with uh, our own conscious experience of each moment of this running person is a moment of reflection, which we say, hmm, yeah, I'm still here. And then again, you know, like a moment later, hmm, yeah, I'm still here. There's a, a continuity of psychological, of, of conscious recognition of the fact of my uh, thinking and intelligence. So persons across time, for since consciousness always accompanies thinking, and it is that which makes everyone to be what he calls self and thereby distinguishes, distinguishes himself from all other thinking things. And this alone consists personal identity, which is to say the sameness of a rational being. And as far as this consciousness can be extended backwards to any past action or thought, so far reaches the identity of that person. So here we finally get a development, a positive development from Locke about what uh, personal identity, numeric personal identity through time will consist in, which is a, psycho a psychological continuity. So person P2 at T2 is the same as P1 at T1, just so long as uh, P2 and P1 are psychologically continuous. But psychologically continuous needs a medium. It needs a vehicle. What is it to say that there is psychological continuity between P1 and P2 uh, at, at T1 and T2, respectively, right? Which is to say that they have the same consciousness. So there's all sorts of objects of our psychology that could uh, stand to be the, the unifying 
uh, for a lot of or, or object that makes us the same thing through time. But for Locke, it's consciousness. It's a conscious experience that continues that makes us the same. So what matters for Locke is the unity of consciousness. But what unites consciousness? How do we know? How do we justify the inference that says, uh, I am the same person that I used to be five minutes ago? How do we, how do we say, uh, I know for certain that I am that person? A memory. I remember being that person, right? I remember five minutes ago. And because I remember it, I can say with pretty strong uh, uh, affectation that, that yeah, I, I'm the same person I was uh, five minutes ago uh, right now. So here we have a psychological continuity criterion precisified into a consciousness criterion and then precisified even further into a memory criterion. So Locke's final definition of personal identity is gonna be that a person P2 at T2 is the same person as P1 at T1 if and only if P2 remembers the experiences of P1. So if the person at a later time has the memories of experiencing the life of P1, then they are the same person. So our memory criteria for Locke, a person is the same uh, just so long as they have the memories of that previous uh, person. It says Locke, had I the same consciousness that I saw the ark and Noah's flood as that I saw an overflowing of the Thames last winter, or that I write now, I could no more doubt that I who write this now that saw the Thames overflowing last winter and that viewed the flood at the general deluge was the same self, place that self in what substance you please that I was yesterday. So let's take a note of what's doing the work here, that there's an experiential memory. It's not just a memory. We don't just craft uh, memories. That, like I, I can't watch a television show. So I, I can't watch say Seinfeld and then have memories of what Seinfeld did and say that I'm Seinfeld. No, I have to have a memory as of the experience of having been there, right? So it's not just that I have a sort of conceptual memory of what happened, but the sort of affective quality of, I, I not only remember it happening, but I remember being there and it happening. So having the experience of. Um, and there, there's also something else important to note here, uh, which is that was it, this was the same self remembering the Thames overflowing last winter. And you could place that self in whatever substance you please. Uh, and I'll still say that it was I that saw this yesterday, right? So what Locke is admitting here is that the memory continuity could exist in whatever substance. It could exist in a parrot or a cat or a human body or uh, a young kid and an old guy, uh, just so long as the memory is what persists, we are, can be satisfied that, that it's the same person. So here we should remember that the important thing is that uh, you continue to persist in an afterlife, that your soul goes on. Um, and if substance is inconsequential, like what form of substance is inconsequential, just so long as the memory is what persists, then any substance that could possibly hold memory could be sufficient for identity. And if the soul, not knowing really what it is, could be a sort of thing that could uh, hold memory, uh, then it could be the sort of substance that allows personal identity to live on and thus be consistent with the existence of an afterlife. So for as far as any intelligent being can repeat the idea of any past action with the same consciousness it had of it at first, and with the same consciousness it has of it at, of any present action, so far it is the same personal self. For it is by consciousness it has of its present thoughts and actions that it is self to itself now, and so will be the same self as far as the same consciousness can extend to actions past or to come. So some advantages. What Locke's memory criterion does is it accommodates a whole lot of common sense intuitions. What matters for us is, uh, with regard to first person uh, identities, is a continuity of thought and action. That when I care about myself, I care about what I've been through time. And what I've been through time is satisfied by what I remember doing through time, right? That I'm a, a, a bundle of memories. I'm a bundle of experiences that float around in my head. And it's also neutral on what realizes consciousness. Self is that conscious thinking thing, whatever substance made of, whether spiritual, soul, or material, simple, or compounded, it doesn't matter. 
which is sensible or conscious of pleasure and pain capable of happiness or misery. And so is concerned for itself. As far as that consciousness ex extends, that's enough for Locke. The physical substance is inconsequential. It is just a vessel that holds what is consequential, which is the continuity of our memory. So um, Locke says, okay, I think that personal identity through time, numeric personal identity through time is a kind of continuity criterion. It is a continuity of psychology realized by conscious experience and substantiated by memory. Uh, now, seeing this, I, I can already, says Locke, I foresee some objections. So let's deal with these objections, the storm on the horizon, right? So uh, some possible problems with the memory criterion is just to say that there could be gaps in consciousness. So like when I sleep, am I not the person that I am when I'm awake? Because I don't remember sleeping, at least not when I, when I uh, don't dream. Um, so that which seems to make a difficulty is this, that this consciousness being interrupted always by forgetfulness, there being no moment of our lives wherein we have the whole train of our past actions before our eyes in one view, but even the best memories losing the sight of one part whilst they're viewing another, and in sound sleep having no thoughts at all, or at least none of that consciousness sort of marks our waking thoughts. So here Locke is just recognizing like, this is an objection. This, this is a problem, a, a potential issue with my view. So Locke might partly defend himself by appealing to a potential connection rather than like an actually realized connection uh, via memory. A continuous stream of consciousness is not required, that I don't need to always be remembering my whole life in order to be the, the past selves that I used to be in those past moments of life. Just so long as I have the capacity to recall, then uh, I am the same person. So, so here's a, a part definite or a part defense against the uh, objection here. Um, but what about cases of significant memory loss? So if you've seen Memento, uh, you could take this on as homework if you wanted to. Uh, this Christopher Nolan movie, uh, Memento, it's really cool. Uh, it, if you don't know it, it's a movie that goes backwards. Um, so the, the conclusion of the movie is the first scene and then the, the end, like the actual temporal and like the last scene of the film is the first scene of the story. So it, it's a movie that goes back, it's really cool. And it deals with substantial memory loss. The main character uh, has short-term memory loss and, and can only remember for about, I think it's like 10 or 15 minutes of, of memory and that's it. And that's why the, mo the movie moves backwards. It's because the, the main character through memory loss is sort of like flashing and trying to discover he, he solves a mystery. Um, it's very cool. Should watch the movie. Take it as a, a homework. So Locke considers cases where one suffers the loss of memory of some parts of one's life, such that one cannot retrieve them. So you get hit on the head and you have amnesia. Are you not the person that you used to be anymore? So Locke's response is to remind us of the distinction between human and of person. It says Locke, we must take notice of the word I is applied to, which in this case is the man only. If it is possible for the same man to have distinct incommunicable consciousness at different times, it is past doubt that the same man would make different persons. So what Locke is saying is, yeah, if you wake up with amnesia, if you bump your head and become someone entirely different, uh, so like if you've taken a basic psychology class, you've probably heard of Phineas Gage. That Phineas Gage before the rail spike was rammed through his brain uh, was a different person than the Phineas Gage after, according to Locke. Uh, because they just make different people, even though the same human persists, right? The same body, the, the animal life of Phineas Gage or of maybe say the main character of Memento is the same body and, and nobody would deny that. The human, the person, the I, right? Is different, substantially different because they share different consciousness. They share different memories. They share different affectations. And this is what matters says Locke uh, to personal identity through time, not really the human body. Is this defense satisfactory? What do you think? So another really fun one that Locke deals with is drunkenness. Isn't the drunk person who doesn't recall his actions justly punished when sober? Thus, isn't the drunk person the same person as the sober person, right? So say you, you drink and you black out. Uh, I would still respond to, like if I were blacked out, I, presumably, I would still respond to people who called me by name. Uh, I would still probably act 
mostly like myself, but, you know, blackout, super wasted drunk, but I would still presumably be like, like recognizable to those around me as like the same person. I wouldn't start like, well, you know, calling like a, a chicken though. I, you know, who knows when you're drunk, uh, but at, at least I'd be somewhat similar, but I, I wouldn't remember, right. That's the whole idea of blacking out is like, I, I like wake up with an awful hangover and I say, what the heck did I get into last night? Um, that am, am, am I not responsible for? Am I not the same person as I was the previous night because I made no memories because my working memory didn't encode itself in long-term because the alcohol like precluded that capacity in my mind. So Locke responds to this objection, that the drunk person objection by invoking a distinction between good legal practice and good metaphysics. Human law punishes both the drunk person and the sober person with a justice suitable to their way of knowledge, because in these cases, they cannot distinguish certainly what is real and what is counterfeit. And so the ignorance in a drunkenness or sleep is not admitted as a plea. Want of consciousness cannot be proved for him. But in the great day, no one shall be made to answer for what he knows nothing of, but shall receive his doom, his conscience accusing or excusing him. So this, I think, is kind of an interesting not only is it an interesting uh, metaphysical point about like what personal identity is, but it, it's also sort of an interesting revelation of Locke's moral intuitions. So what Locke is saying is, look, in the human world, we can't distinguish between blacked out, drunk, uh, and sober person. And so we treat them as the same person. And if blacked out, drunk person uh, gets like a public intox, and like pees in the, in the street or whatever, and, uh, or like, you know, breaks the window of some building because they're drunk, I, you know, who knows, like the, the a blacked out hooligan breaking the law and causing harm to people. That this person wakes up and in their sober life uh, is now a different person according to Locke. But in the great day, meaning like in the rapture when that person goes to heaven, what he's saying is that, the person won't be made to answer for what they don't know anything of, meaning that they won't be responsible for their harmful actions that they caused when they were blacked out drunk. They'll only be uh, uh, asked to, to account for by St. Peter of the Pearly Gates, what they remember. Uh, and so human justice is imperfect compared to um, uh, like, you know, the, the justice done in the great day uh, because God's omniscience can tell the difference between uh, drunk hooligan and sober hooligan. And I, I think this is kind of an interesting idea as well, because it, it, um, it, it makes me wonder whether Locke thinks that there's many different people persisting in us or that like exist and go out of existence all the time. So say like I get blackout drunk in the great day, does blackout drunk Spencer of this particular day, uh, does that person get judged just as well as like sober me that like lives most of my life? Um, I think it's an open question and an interesting one. And this whole like discussion, I find really fascinating. It's, there's a lot of back and forth that like good for Locke to have anticipated. You fight with the strength oh, of many men tonight. Uh, hold on. Can you I am that? Arthur, king <laughs> of the Britons. It's the Monty Python. Okay, sorry. Uh, Monty Python started playing. I don't know if you could hear that or not, but it's the video that's linked in this um, PowerPoint in the earlier slide. But this is a really cool discussion um, from Locke in that it, it deals with objections that are really serious for his view. Um, he contends with them admirably, but in doing so questionably uh, weakens his position uh, quite a bit, but at least it creates a fertile ground for a whole lot of other thought, which um, is what happens, historically speaking. And we'll see more of this next week. We're, we're going to deal more with personal identity next week uh, and, and the responses to, to Locke and some of the problems with personal identity. It's going to be kind of a fun lecture. We'll do a whole bunch of thought experiments. Um, and I'll be uh, like cueing your intuitions to, to see where you're at what you think personal identity is. Um, but Locke really begins this all and 
And in this back and forth gives us some really interesting, though maybe unsatisfactory answers, but maybe satisfactory as well, um, but interesting answers nonetheless to some objections. So concluding lock, uh, we have a continuity criterion, which is a form of, uh, which, which is what numeric identity for persons through time consists in. Psychology is what is continuous for persons and it's memory that realizes the um, persistence of psychology through consciousness uh, for a person. So again, for Locke, what it is to be a person is to have a, a consistent memory that has the potential capacity to recall those memories uh, with the sort of experiential power with the ability to say, yes, I did that. So there you go. That's Locke. Um, that is uh, our lecture for uh, this week. Next week, we'll continue with personal identity. We will uh, do a whole bunch of really fun thought experiments. So if you can make it to class, I recommend that you do. But if you can't, then you know the thought experiments are still really fun and will be fun to watch regardless. Um, if you can't make it to the live recording, we'll be back to our normal uh, scheduled live recordings in person or through Zoom or asynchronously if, if you can't make the live recording uh, next Thursday. Um, and we'll also talk about alternatives to um, there being any personal identity at all. Um, so great, that's this. Uh, I'll see you all next week. Um, thanks for bearing with me through the, the recorded lecture this one. Uh, hope you enjoyed it and uh, see you in the next one.